and uh, they immediately took a second giant pass. Our geology students, 62% of our geology students go on to graduate school. National average is 25%. Our criminal justice program, our graduates from our MCOLS Academy, which is the Professional Officers Academy, we have the highest placement rate of any program in the state. Our teacher education program was in trouble three years ago. The state even said so. And so we totally restructured it. And we went from being 33rd out of 33 teacher education programs in passing of the Michigan teacher exam to number two. Our wildlife and fisheries program is, is renowned. Uh, the Michigan DNR fish production, you know we have a big uh, fish program in our state here, very important to the economy. Over half of all the people working in that program are graduates of Lake Spear State University, including the director of the state's uh, fish uh, rearing program. And all the Atlantic salmon in the upper Great Lakes come from our little aquatics research lab. We now provide the state with uh, fish eggs so they can augment what we do. And uh, the Atlantic salmon is going to become a more important cod in the uh, Great Lakes fisheries over the years and they're turning to us for expertise. Michigan DNR officers, there's approximately 200 in the state, over 40 come straight from the Lake Superior State University. Our Fish and Wildlife Club is one of the most active club nationally for the last six years. I don't know if the other schools are even applying. Our business grads on the ETS exit exam, comparing them with graduates from over 600 universities, are in the top 25%, and in many areas in the top 5 or 10%. And our engineering uh, graduates pass the professional exam for engineering, their first professional exam, 15 points higher than the national average. Last year, they had a three job offers each, average job offer $55,000 for starting salary. Our political science grads looks like a who's who of premier law schools where they were accepted with assistantship. One of them, them roles, uh, had an unsolicited application to Harvard Law School. They called her and she turned it down because Michigan State made a full offer to cover all costs. Our social science seniors, we've had the undergraduate research paper of the year in the state of Michigan four out of the last five years. Our graduates count for less than one half of one percent of all the graduates in the state, and we outperform many, many of our bigger brothers and sisters. One of our students, Henry Dietrich, made such a unique proposal that he's now going to be working with the Smithsonian Institution and the National Geographic Society to carry it out. They love it. As you can see, we're pretty proud of our students, and uh, we produce a lot of great ones. Now, my second and final point, we're also used to being overlooked by the big newspapers now in the state. Within a week, when the free press is handling charter schools and their authorizers, it was nice not to be mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> and for that, I want to thank you board members who run our Charter Academy. Just like our students, we're very proud of what our Charter Academies do. And it means that you are doing the oversight that is expected of running a quality school. Over the years, we took the position that we wanted to avoid cookie cutter approach and not just crank out numbers. So as we talk with each other today, I think you find that there's a great diversity in the schools you represent and there are a few similarities. Two of the similarities are your focus on students and the focus on excellence. I thank you for being great stewards of our academies and for the students who attend your schools, the students of our state. And just a thought, how long do you think we're going to need to wait for that free press follow-up story that says, in the course of our investigation, we did find a number of really great charters that were authorized by Lake Superior State University. 
don't think we're going to see it in a while. Don't hold your breath. So thank you again for your service.
family situation that you would not be able to attend. And at the end of the conversation, he says, Nick, I owe you. In fact, in my mind, I'm thinking, yes, you owe me big time. <laughs> <laughs> he sent his uh, award-winning team uh, to make the presentation. They were coming anywhere, but they were going to be doing a little bit more, I think, than they had anticipated. Uh, the first presenter, is Jason Sarfield, and Jason was also with uh, Charlton Heston, and uh, as I said, he comes with a, a lot of us experience as all of their uh, presenters today. Uh, I think he has some really interesting things that he's going to be presenting to you, uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, he has a part of his team that was also a contributor, and I'll let him introduce that. Great morning. Good morning. <laughs> Not a good morning. It's a great morning. It's a great to be here with everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by busting Bruce's chops a little bit. He's out in Vegas, couldn't be here. Uh, three of us are heading to Vegas this afternoon to see if they no, tomorrow afternoon or evening. And so I don't see why he couldn't do both as well. So we gotta bust his chops a little bit. Bear with me as I get the technology started. Can everyone hear me all right? Joe, can you hear me all right back there? <laughs> all right. I'm on a first name basis with some folks, and I told them not to fall asleep. This is what we call them. <laughs> it's our pleasure to be here today. My name is Jason Sarsfield. We're with the National Charter Schools Institute. Uh, I have two of my colleagues, uh, Joe Urban and Julie Hopper. I'll let them introduce hey, themselves <laughs> momentarily. Uh, it's great to be here at Lake State for a number of reasons. We enjoy our long-standing partnership with Lake Superior State University. Nick and his team providing support and thought leadership with them in the work that they do. But I can also say on behalf of uh, school leaders and boards such as yourselves, it's a great partnership to have with Lake State and their team. Uh, I know as being part of a founding team of an academy that, was author that is authorized by Lake State, that they view their role not just as oversight, but as partners and support functions. And so not every authorizer in the state of Michigan and across the country has that perspective. And so I wanted to recognize, to start with Nick and his team, and having the courage to say we're not just going to monitor and evaluate you, but we're going to support you along the way as well. Um, and so we, we really appreciate that perspective. Uh, I want to start a little bit with a story, actually, that Nick teed up, uh, which is uh, our leader, Jim Gunner, uh, is uh, unfortunately unable to be with us today. and. Uh, Jim said, you know, Jason, why don't you call Nick and tell him? I said, no way, you're calling Nick and tell him. I said, you know how mean and ornery Nick is. I said, I'm not even going to take that on. you got to do it. So he calls Nick, and later on in the, in the morning after he spoke to Nick, he calls me, and he said, we got big, big problems, Jason. And uh, Nick is really bad, and we got some damage control to do with Nick. And I thought to myself immediately, well, that's kind of understandable. Short notice, Jim, you're not going to be here. And he said, you know, Nick really said, you know, I've been playing you up, Jim. And, and you know, I told my president and our board of candidates, our candidate boards that Jim Bonner, you know, nationally recognized is going to be here. Now you're going to send a second-rate team? <laughs> and I thought to myself as I'm talking, Jim, did he really call a second-rate? <laughs> he said, yeah. And, and I said, I told him, Jason, I said, you know, Jason's been around the country, he's done a lot of great things. He can lead the charge, and Julia and Joe will do a great job. And then Nick says to me, Jason, well, can Jason even behave himself? <laughs> I told him, Jason, you even wear a suit these days. And I thought to myself, you know, I thought I had more credibility with Nick. I'm blown away, Jim. I'm really blown away. And immediately I'm thinking, my dear friends and colleagues from Charlton Heston Academy, they're going to have to vouch for me. I've got to buy some credibility somewhere. And then he said, well, maybe, you know, Joe and Julie really ought to take the lead on that first presentation on Saturday morning. Maybe you ought to just take a back seat, Jason. I thought, maybe. I just didn't know I had a real credibility problem with Nick. 
And then he says, you know, and Jim really likes to use analogies. And he said, you know, Jason, have you ever had you know, been out fishing and throwing the line out there? And he knows I like to fish. And he says, have you ever really got that big one out? You really wonder if it's going to snap or not. And you really get a real good. I said, Jim, I'm sorry. Enough with the analogies. I'm really a little bit upset right now. You know, let's let's have a little plan of attack. And he goes, Well, I'm reeling you in, Jason, and I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> so one of our mantras is we like to have fun. And Jim had a whole heck of a lot of fun with me last night. Uh, but in all honesty, he said, No, Nick is totally understanding. Uh, family first, and uh, he's got all the confidence in the world. You guys are going to do a great job tomorrow. And so one of our goals for today is to have fun. And I think we all take our our work seriously as we should your work in terms of your fiduciary responsibility uh, on behalf of the kids that your academy serve, but we can't take ourselves too seriously. So that's one of our goals today, uh, throughout tomorrow, certainly tonight. Um, and on that note, I do have one uh, unfortunate announcement. One of uh, the things that we embody in terms of our core values at the Institute is uh, honesty, and directness, and putting brutal facts on the table. And so I got a text actually that, uh, and Nick's not even aware of this, that uh, there's been some problems with the boat crews, and it's been canceled tonight. So, Nick, I'm not sure what the backup plan is. I'm kayak. Uh, I'm just joking. Really, that's why we're here as well, is to take the boat crews. So, uh, we look forward to that one day. Uh, again, have a little fun. Uh, we want to start off with what's core to our values, our work with boards, with authorizers, and that's relationships, and that's what you guys are all about. And you know, the, the mantra says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And none of you are in it for the money, obviously, or the prestige, but you're in it because you care about kids. You care about winning for kids in your role as a board member. So we want to recognize that today, and I think you'll hear that theme throughout today's uh, opening session and into tomorrow's sessions, uh, that while we can talk about the technical details, we can talk about assessment data, we can talk about board policies, and all kinds of technical uh, stuff that's important, let's not lose sight of the relationships. The relationships you have with your leaders, your management organizations, with your authorizer, with each other as board members. And so we'll talk about uh, various ways we can enhance relationships throughout today and tomorrow. You know, we like to show this slide on a number of our presentations across the country because uh, our mission is to transform education. And that's a bold mission. Uh, we do that through a variety of coaching, presentation tools um, that we offer. Uh, but ultimately, that's what we're all here for. And this idea of charter schools uh, 20 years ago and now coming really to fruition uh, was about a bold idea of providing excellence in education for our kids to help our state, our communities, and our country. And so the work that you all do to ensure that that happens is critically important. And it's a bold, bold uh, vision and mission that I think we can all wake up every day and get excited about. Just a real quick uh, background on our organization so you know who we are and where we come from. Uh, the National Charter Schools Institute uh, started in 1995. We're a values driven nonprofit organization. Some of you may know Epicenter, which is the software tool uh, that we uh, provide to authorizers uh, to work with schools and providing. Uh, document management, workflow, compliance, um, but really the conduit for some of the communications between authorizers and schools. Uh, our mission is to strengthen performance productivity across the sector. We're called the National Charter Schools Institute, and only uh, more recently have we really gone national. So uh, we're active in about 15 states, uh, working closely with school boards, authorizers, and schools. Um, and so we've, uh, I think, been able to take a lot of what we've learned throughout our travels across the country and been able to share those with groups uh, such as yourself. Uh, we coach and consult with boards. Many of you uh, may, uh, in your board, subscribe to our board policy service uh, with the annual updates. So that's another tool that we do provide uh, uh, to strengthen, again, productivity and performance across the charter school sector with the various key players. Uh, our team is composed of passionate professionals. We are all in, much as yourself. I had a privilege of speaking with Pastor in the back uh, this morning who said, uh, you know, I'm going to have somebody else cover my service tomorrow because I feel it's really important to be here uh, and in my role as a board. He's all in. He's passionate about what he does, and that's a commitment. And so we're all in as well, and we're passionate about what we do. I think that will come across uh, throughout today and tomorrow. 
We seek to understand, honor, and support our partners and clients. Uh, we practice the principle of seek first, understand, um, and then support and help. We believe in and, and strive to uphold um, all the golden rules of respect, um, and again, seek first to understand and move forward uh, productively. You've got copies, but I also want to let you know that uh, all of our presentations, this one of the two, uh, actually the three tomorrow, will be available on our website as well as presentations we give at other events and conferences. Um, and so I encourage you, if you uh, are like me, you lose the hard copy somewhere in between here and the car, maybe in between the car and the, and, and, uh, the lower peninsula, if you're heading that direction, that uh, you can always go to our website and access this slide deck as well as others. So uh, this morning, what we want to do, uh, and my colleagues are going to jump in and join me in a moment, uh, we want to have uh, you know, some, some basic goals to tee this up. One, we want to share a framework for greatness and establish a common vocabulary. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about Jim Collins' work around moving from good to great and some principles and framework around governing for greatness today. Introduce some common language, common themes that I've already introduced that we'll come back to tomorrow throughout the sessions tomorrow that will get more into detail. Uh, but we really want to set the context for digging in. We want to get to know each other, so in a moment I'm going to ask you guys to introduce yourselves, your schools, where you're from, uh, because we can sit up here and talk all day, tomorrow afternoon, or tomorrow morning, uh, but really we want to also have some dialogue so you guys can learn from each other. We've got brand new schools, schools that have been around for a while, boards in different stages of development, so we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to hear from each other and learn from each other uh, today and tomorrow. We want to collaborate in that way and inspire hearts and minds uh, because you know, this is uh, tremendously important work that we all do. And if you're not inspired about it, uh, you know you shouldn't be here. And by being here, uh, that certainly shows that you're inspired about it, you take your work seriously, you want to take a weekend out of your lives, in addition to all the other time that you commit to your academies to uh, get a little sharper yourself, build that relationship with the authorizer, uh, and continue to be inspired. I want to make sure we answer questions. Please, please feel free to raise your hand, jump in throughout the presentation today and tomorrow. Um, we'll be around during the events, the campus tours, uh, the, the dinner boat ride tonight. So if you have questions, we may be of assistance in different ways. Uh, please just uh, come up and chat with us. We've got a nice small group here. So I think it'll be real conducive to some um, shoulder conversations and things that may be helpful to you. Um, and so please feel free to approach us uh, at your level. And of course, we want to have some fun. So we will do that uh, throughout the presentations. Obviously, we'll have some fun on both tonight. And uh, you know, again, I think uh, you can certainly have fun and be serious and, and get this work done all at the same time. So at this time, uh, I'd like to just get to know each other real quick and I'd like to introduce uh, our team, actually have them introduce uh, themselves. Uh, but as you know, I'm Jason Sarsfield. Uh, I have served as a teacher, uh, a school leader for an academy that, uh, as, as Nick said, is authorized by Lake State. I've also worked for two national authorizers, uh, Central Michigan University and the State University of New York for a lot of years in providing oversight and evaluation of schools. So I have had the blessing and been fortunate to see this thing called charter schools from a number of different angles. Uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Joe Urban. Uh, to introduce himself, and then we'll uh, turn it over to you. Yeah, Joe Urban, I'm uh, with the Institute. I actually moonlighted the Institute. I'm also a partner at the law firm Clark Hill. We're a nationwide law firm providing uh, legal services to all sorts of people, um, and all sorts of things, and all sorts of industries. And um, I've been in charter schools for probably the last 20 years. That's all I do um, is public school academies. Um, also, I've um, been working with the Institute for about the last year and a half as part of last year as part of the leadership team. Um, we're looking forward to having some fun, um, talking about board governance, and uh, just uh, overall getting to know each other. And Ms. Julie Hopper. I will try and yell loudly. Jenny, you're going to kill me. I'm not mic'd up, so I will try and project my voice. Um, I'm Julie Hopper, and actually I'm from this area. I grew up in the Sioux. I was a former teacher, and I just joined um, the National Charter School Institute in January. And prior to that, I worked for another for an authorizer. Uh, Bay Mills Community College for a number of years, and I was in charge of academics. So I want to thank you, first off, for everything that you do. Um, you have our utmost admiration. I know my colleagues feel the same um, for donating your time and trying to make a difference in the lives of kids. So you don't have to listen to me today, but tomorrow you will. So it's a pleasure to be here, and it's nice to meet 
of you. And I look forward to obviously seeing with you later today. Great. Uh, thanks, Jess. So why don't we do this? Stand up if you're a board member of an LSU authorized agenda. Kind of what we expected, right? <laughs> How about uh, sitting down if your academy has not yet opened its door to kids? How about sitting down if your academy just finished its first year of operation? How about if it just finished its second year of operation? Now, this is part of the quiz, you should probably know. How it <laughs> if it just finished its third year of operation, just finished its fourth year of operation, fifth year, sixth year, so the veterans are really the veterans, seventh year, eighth. It's night. Ten? Do you guys really know how long you speak? Eleven? Finishes twelve here. Thirteen? Fourteen? Fifteen?
can't get to the point that they have a report card is characterized with education and the respect the kids um, give to each other, adults, um, teachers. It's a comment that is always brought up in our school. And as a parent of uh, uh, the, one of the student, one student that graduated from K through 12, and my daughter, my younger daughter, is in junior high, always getting comments on how well spoken my girls are. So I think that is definitely one of our problems. And that's the true test, right? Would you send your own kid there? <laughs> My name is Jerry Zanstra. I'm the uh, board president of I Academy, which is in West Michigan in Zealand. Uh, this is year one for us. We just finished. Um, I'm most proud of the fact that we're still here. Uh, that's a, I, I'm really proud of our teachers and our administrator. We are a uh, cyber school, a blended school, and figuring out how to do that and to do it well. Um, is a challenge and uh, just really really proud we are uh, k-12 um, my youngest son was last year the, uh, we had sort of a beta program and he was one of two graduates just there were six students we just tried him out and he was one of two and he was not valedictorian and i was just <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Tuohy. I'm uh, with Ridge Park Trevor Academy in, uh, in Grand Rapids, actually Grand Rapids, Tampa Border. Um, we have a, uh, a very transient group, uh, very in the area that it's at right there. Usually, enrollment has been the uh, not so much. The problem has not been enrollment; it's been keeping the same kids. In. So it's been interesting enough with the numbers to be able to keep that at. Um, and that's probably one of the things that uh, that we're most proud of is the, the diversity um, that we actually bring into the school. Um, and there are uh, flags, as a matter of fact, for each country where we have students that line the hallways. And uh, the last count, I believe we had 69, or excuse me, 62 up from 59 last year. So, uh, but currently we have 662 students. Uh, this is, uh, again, at, at that point, our 17th year uh, that we're starting out. So, uh, and we have Shannon Ostoff, and who's our, one of our current board members, and then John Lawrence, who we're just waiting for the final approval from LSSU. Mm -hmm. to, uh, <laughs> get the blessing, we'll be another board. Well, that's also part of the benefit of being up here. You can nudge him if you need to nudge him. <laughs> exactly. And wow, what an opportunity with all the countries represented in your student population for them to learn from each other. Much like I hope you all learn from each other today and tomorrow. So thank you for that. Hi, I'm Abe Monte from Concord Kevin Boyne. Uh, we were a little off on the map, and we've actually been around 19 years. <laughs> um, we are in Boyne City, Michigan, and we have about 210 students, roughly. So I've been around since 1985, served K through 12 grade. Um, I think we're the most proud of, similar to Grand Traverse Academy, is character education. I'd say it's just, we, it, we focus on being a safe place for kids that they're in, where there's individual focus on every child and heavy, heavy character education. I send my own kids there because of that reason. So um, great, glad to be here. That's it. You guys Hi, my name is Orlando Woods. Uh, the name of our school is Detroit Service Learning Academy, and uh, we've been around for over 15 years, since 1999. Um, our vice president is James Dozier, and our uh, treasurer is Ivy Jeggedy. And um, I've been the board president for, um, just finished my uh, first year. I've been on the board for approximately four years. And uh, I would say that uh, being in the city of Detroit, what we're most proud of is that uh, we continue to grow. Uh, and we believe that uh, says a lot about our school. Uh, our board model is um, uh, excellence is in our DNA. And that's one of the things that we talk to our parents and our students about on a regular basis. Thank you. And I'm with the Detour Arts and Technology Academy, and that is in Detour, Michigan. It's only 60 miles from here. So obviously, we are very familiar with Lake State, Alma Mater, as well as Steve Mason. This is Ron Pappen. And the thing that we are, we have been an academy for three years. And we have, LSSU took us over as <coughs> about a year ago. And we are only at 42 in our K through six, but we also have an online 
Academy as well. The thing that we, we are most proud of is keeping our doors open for our students, and also we have received the School of Excellence Award. We also are very proud of the fact that in our arts portion of our academy, every year our kids do a play, and that involves the K through the high school. And it has been a wonderful thing for our kids because you can go to a function like this and stand up and talk in front of people if you learn it very early, I think, because this is one of the hardest things to do for most of us. Thank you. I think that's a reminder of we have lots of schools in rural areas that economically it's tough. Um, to keep the doors open uh, with such few students. you got to be creative and innovative on the financial side. Um, so kudos for you for that. Okay, hi. I'm Liz Bauer. I'm president of the Board of Way Academy in Detroit. Patrick Burroughs right here. Our former treasurer to take the break from treasurer this year, but he's still on the board. And this afternoon during the tours, you'll see Pamela Wong, who's another board member to grab you up this morning. Uh, we've been open on our Southwest Detroit site since August 2012 and in our Brightmoor site since August 2013, so not quite two years anywhere. We have 360 kids in Southwest, 180 in Brightmoor High School kids. We, our motto, if we're going to have a motto, is that every child has potential, every child can learn. We will never, ever expel or separate a student from our campus. No matter what the events we think, put the supports around and keep them up. We're a standards focus, 3,800 standards in the Michigan Merit Curriculum have to be uh, achieved through pro projects that, are, that, that demonstrate proficiency. We can make it credit. Uh, it's blended learning, 50 50 open year round. We don't have to advertise. There are enough students, unfortunately, that have been put aside by other educational institutions and they find their way to us, and that's why we have so many. So far, we've graduated 48, and that means that 48 of those 500 kids that are working with us in the less than a year have met the standards in the Michigan American curriculum. So I think it's pretty fantastic, and we are happy about it. She's got the elevator pitch down, dedication of our staff and our volunteers, um, I would have to say is the uniqueness of our arts enriched curriculum. Everything that we do at GREAT, art is infused in it, whether it's math, science, geography, everything we do, we put arts and technology in it. <laughs> 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 
Good evening. I don't think I really need a mic. Jamie mm -hmm. Robinson from the American International Academy Schools in Westland, Michigan. We have uh, been a school for going into our fourth year, after which I hope that our school be able to be a number one charter school in the area for all people. As you can remember, there are no schools in the Inkster area, so bringing this school out into the public will be a plus for us. The most really good thing that I'm proud of is the fact that the curriculum that we have chosen for the year 2013 and 14 is outstanding. So we need all of your prayers, all of you to stand with us as we move this charter school forward. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Tony Smith. I don't need a mic either. <laughs> I'm from um, Sarah Weber Media Arts Academy in Pontiac, Michigan. We have roughly about 100 kids. This was our, We just finished our first year. Um, our curriculum is based on um, radio and TV broadcasting, so the students get to learn about how to make their own radio station, uh, TV, uh, TV show, uh, all in the media arts area. And then um, we recently saw growth, even though um, this school centers in a very, dis um, I could say, deserted area. So um, there's not really any schools you know, close by. But um, the kids still come and they're still motivated and we're just happy to complete our first year and bringing that new innovative technology piece uh, to the school. Um, it's really nice for kids. And what we're proud of is our um, growth on the NWEA just, just for that first year, bringing the kids from you know here to here, just in one year span. Still got a lot to grow, but we're proud of that. six board members that's attending. Um, I didn't know that I was going to be the only one until this morning. But, um, we will be adding on our eighth grade, so we'll be K-8 uh, starting in the fall. And the thing that I, oh, I've been with the board, this is my second year, and I came on the board as a parent board member, so two of my children were attending the school as well. And the thing that I am most proud of is out of the National Heritage Academy, Regent Park Scholar going, just finishing our third year, has jumped to one of the top schools in their rate of growth. So that's huge because it's an impoverished year. of the board for InnoCademy Elegant Campus, um, which is related to some of the other InnoCademies that you've heard from already this morning. We are in the process of enrolling our very first year of students. We have 26 students um, so far, and so we have a ways to go. But I'm very excited about the fact that we are a K through fifth grade alternative to the local public school in a very rural community where there really are no other options. And so that's very exciting. And I think the thing I'm proudest of is even though we have yet to um, actually educate one single student, we have parents that have come to our facility and they've volunteered to work on uh, renovations and repairs of our building. So we have some very excited parents, and that makes me very, very happy. My name is Roger Bumgarner. I am the president, president of the board of the Inno Academy Pyramid Campus School, which is a brand new charter school. We just received our charter in May. Uh, Next period. And uh, 
We are just getting started. We had our first meeting in, in, in May, board meeting. We'll be located in Kentwood, Michigan, which is just in the southeast side of suburban Grand Rapids. And we'll be located in the, the former Steelcase Pyramid R&D Center, which is where the pyramid came from. Uh, we, uh, we will open in the fall of 2015, so we've got about a year to go to get ready for this. And we're in a high, fairly high density area, so we expect to have a lot of students. Anybody wants to give us any advice or anything, I'll give you my contact information, feel free to contact us, because we'll be going to help you can get getting this thing going. Uh, we'll be focusing on engineering technology, of course, uh, but we also added aid to our STEAM, which is for the arts also, so uh, we'll be focusing on arts when we can too. So. Uh, glad to be here. This is our first visit to next period. Great. And I think <laughs> we have a number of schools that just finished their first year. And uh, reflecting back on that experience uh, for myself and our team, wow, sometimes, while well, that first year, I, we did it, and we did it good, but I don't always know exactly how we did it. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts, and it's an ambitious, bold challenge that you're going to tackle. And so I think there's probably lots of folks in the room uh, that can uh, offer some real practical uh, advice. Did everybody get a chance to go? I just want to make sure I don't. I told him, not that Larry, this Larry. <laughs> Larry, what are you most proud of about your Lake Superior State team? Um, I'm proud of the fact that um, we have a great uh, mindset of philosophy on, on charter school staff. Uh, I started the school, we were originally chartered by a different university, and the relationship was not close at all. It was very distant. The school that I was at, we switched over to LSSU because we felt like it would be a partnership. And that has been my experience as a school director. And now that I'm on the team, I see among the team, our focus is how can we help you, how, which you can minister to the kids. So uh, I'm very blessed to be in the position I'm in to be part of this <coughs> educational movement. So very grateful for that. <coughs> Well, I'll tell you another story. I like to tell stories. And uh, I call Larry Uncle Larry. That's a uh, term that I coined, and I'm proud of it because he would come to our board meetings, and the board meetings would be about 7 o'clock, and he'd show up at 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Larry, you're a little early for a board meeting. He'd do a little work at the table in the back, but then I'd be like, where's Larry? He'd be in the gymnasium <laughs> playing with the kids. <laughs> He'd be beaten and greeting and speaking with and supporting the staff in a very welcoming way, which is really true for him for the team at Lake State. Um, and so um, I appreciated my relationship when I was at the school with you, Larry. Um, and calling you Uncle Larry is nothing but a compliment. Thank you. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is transition to some of the content and again, establishing a framework. Uh, that we'll come back to uh, throughout today and tomorrow. Uh, our team at the National Church Schools Institute uh, are big Jim Collins fans. And those of you that are familiar with Jim Collins, good to great. He's also published some work on good to great uh, for the public sector. Uh, I encourage you guys to get a copy of this uh, because I think what it does is it provides a framework, an attitude, and principles to follow 
as board members, as leaders of your organizations, uh, to really win for kids every day. And so, the question really is, what is greatness? Anyone dare to answer that question? What is greatness? No takers. Mr. Irvin, what is great? Uh, superior performance. Oh, come on. <laughs> well, what I can tell you in one of the slides to follow, what Collins would say, and we subscribe to, one of the biggest ways you're never going to get to greatness is if you think you're already great. And goodness. Simply being good is a barrier to being great. Because it's good enough, it's the status quo. You guys didn't start your schools to be the status quo. You haven't been around for 19 or 20 years. <coughs> to just be as good as the other option, or the other options. You establish your schools, you come to your board meetings and commit your time because you want to be great. And so this is a mindset that we'll talk more through we get into some of the details, we really encourage you to read Collins' work and adopt the mindset first and foremost of saying, good is not good enough for our kids. we got to be great, but once we think we're great, we lost sight of the fact that we can always get better. And what Collins would say, and it totally applies to public school academies, is there are three major components of greatness. Superior performance. It's not just good enough <coughs> to perform better than a marginal option down the road. I think as a sector, we would encourage everyone to say, that's not good enough. If you've got a very low performing district of residents, and you're only outperforming them a little bit, and that's your argument of why you're great, we're doing better than a bad district? That's not great. And that's, I think, a perspective as a sector, as a community, we all need to adopt. Now, is it easy? Heck no. <coughs> we know it's not easy. We know it's not exact science. What is the mindset? Distinctive impact. What's your distinctive impact? Are you a year-round school? Are you a STEAM school? Are you an art school? Are you a character ed school? A little bit of everything. Well, could you, as board members, describe what your distinctive impact is? We'll talk a little bit about the hedgehog principle, which relates to this. These are questions to contemplate. If you can't figure out or articulate what your distinctive impact is, you might want to have some conversations around that. And lasting endurance. As a leader, one of the humbling, most humbling things as a leader is. When you leave, and the organization's even better without you. Right. <laughs> Boy, it's like, I thought it was good. Guess I'm not that good. But someday, as board members, you'll move on yourselves. How will your academies be performing and be governed when you're no longer in the seat? How will your academies be performing when your level five leader that you currently have takes an opportunity somewhere else, and a new leader comes in. Will there be lasting endurance? These are old principles. Questions to pose to yourself and your colleagues back here on your boards. What are you doing as a board to ensure that there's succession plans, that things are institutionalized, so that when that leader does take a great opportunity, everything doesn't go with them, out the door with them. We'll come back to these as we continue. As Colin says, good is the enemy of great. And I believe that. Good is the enemy of great. Greatness is a journey, right? A journey we're all striving toward. It's just not good enough. Third grade teacher. 
the school I helped lead, she had the best results in the school. The kids in reading and math were making a year and a half to two years worth of growth for the year they were in her school, or in her classroom. What I loved about her the most was, she always said that's not good enough. She'd always find one kid in the averages that actually didn't meet the target, that the averages kind of hit. And she said, I didn't do a good enough job for that kid. It's not good enough. And while we want to understand our leadership, the challenges that they pose, uh, we want to be respectful that as board members, a relentless pursuit of excellence and results gets you on your journey towards greatness. But just simply accepting the report from the school leader without asking the right questions and pushing them in a healthy way is not going to get you on that journey towards greatness. And so what Collins further says is there's a framework for moving towards greatness, knowing that we're never really there. And it's all about discipline, really. It starts with people. First who, then what? Encourage your school leaders to stop that principle. You've got to get the rock stars on the bus. It's the people first, then what? That level five leadership. Who has a great leader running your school? Raise your hand. Anybody have a great leader? Anybody share to describe some of the things that make them great? Like that. I guess one of the things for ours, and actually uh, we've had a, an interesting fact, we've got a, had a, some turnaround in the leadership at our school. Um, uh, actually, due to some unfortunate circumstances, uh, first of all, the uh, uh, death of our principal, um, while being the city there, uh, then we brought in uh, you know, a fantastic uh, gentleman who was able to kind of uh, smooth the waters as they went through and make an excellent transition. And now we've got a, uh, a new principal, this being his, uh, his second, uh, we'll be starting out his second year. But one thing that has just already put him apart from where we've seen before has been his passion. And that's been the one thing that we've seen always in all the other administrators that we've had. We've had a passion for the kids. But this is a passion that is not contained. Uh, and so, so it's not just a passion that we can talk about and we can say, you know, I'm passionate about the kids, I am. But this is someone who is just exuberant with passion. And he shows that not only in how he's helping the teachers, the other administrators there, becoming better themselves, but in that he's pushing himself as well to make everything better. And it's, uh, it rubs off not only on everyone else around him, but on the kids as well. So that's, uh, that's one thing that separates him and makes him really You use the word infectious, and I gotta pick on Keith. Because I was having a conversation with Keith, and he referred to the team here at Lake State as staff. And I said, staff? You have staff here? What do you think of when you hear the word staff? <laughs> think of hospitals, <laughs> right? But actually, he, he gave it back to me pretty good. He goes, yeah, you think about infection, and we're infectious. So he turned that around. So we use the word team. I don't want to be part of a team. I don't want to be part of a staff. How about one more that wants to share what makes their leader great? Um, we have a CEO that, that leads the organization. And I think the one thing that really, to me, to me, where it stands out, and I've been with the board for a very short period of time, I've taken the spot of another person who moved into a consulting for the school. But I think that the thing that he named was the thing that I was thinking of, passion. And you can see the passion. Um, you see the emails coming at 6.30 or 6 o'clock a.m. Um, I wonder, does she ever sleep? Um, <laughs> so it's just that passion that and even though she brings a lot of experience into the position running um, uh, human resources area, she also brings a passion for the children in, in learning that. And I think that she's looking for opportunities to build the board to where we are filling, fulfilling our role. So I just see her passion all the way around. She the pushes way. you too. She yeah. pushes me too. That's great. <laughs> yes, thank you. Now the question is, would the best leader want to work for you in your board? Would the most dynamic, level five leaders want to work for you? Or would you try to be crazy? Would you micromanage them? Would you get in their hair? If they had any, I don't have a whole lot, so that doesn't matter. Or would you challenge them? Give them room to lead? Set clear expectations? 
measure those expectations, communicate clarity, speak with one voice, and support him in that way, him or her. That's a tough question. And I'm not talking about just a good leader. Would a great leader want to work for you and your board? Grapple with that. Collins further says discipline thoughts followed by discipline actions. And that's building greatness to last. So it's first two, then what? Confronting the brutal facts. Are your board meetings more about substance or are they more about style? So I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of board meetings focused on style for a long, long time. It's called the status quo. Do they talk about student achievement at every board meeting? Is that their laser focus? Or are they more worried and concerned with things around the edges, if at all? <laughs> are they willing to be honest and direct and confront those brutal facts? The hedgehog concept. What are you, what is your school going to be the best at in the world? That's a tough one. A lot, a lot of schools want to be the best at a lot of things. We encourage you to bring clarity to your organizations as a board by deciding what's most important. Do I want to be year round, STEAM, the arts? Do I want to have a grant flag program? Do I want to have cyber school? Do I want to do all those things? Collins would say that's not going to move you to greatness. That's going to provide some distractions. So, what's your hedgehog principle? What are you going to be the best at in the world? And once disciplined people are on the bus, there are dots of common discipline thought, discipline action, leads to building greatness that lasts. I'd like to put this slide up to illustrate that. That once discipline thought, followed by discipline actions, at some point, and I think this may have been happening for some of our 15, 18 year schools, you start to hit your flywheel. And this is hard for some of you that are just starting schools to kind of think about. That's not going to get easy, but you're going to hit your flywheel. If you have discipline people on the bus, discipline principles, discipline actions, at some point you hit that flywheel and you really launch toward enduring greatness. But it's a journey. It doesn't happen in one year. It doesn't happen in three years often. It's a long journey. Joe, how am I doing? Doing great. And then Dad? Not Dad. Julie? Oh, come on. Sure. How do you attract believers? How does your school leader or management company attract believers? How do you build your brand? The former politician over here, sounds like you've built your brand. You've got the talking points now. That's important. Well, you believe in them, yep. number one. I mean, you know, you have to articulate your vision, and then you have Then you have to revisit the, the, the strategies. So who executes the plan? You or school leadership? Well, the school leadership management company that we have executes things. We're, our job is really to build, like we build the house, <laughs> and then they populate it and do stuff in it. And Make sure the plumbing's <laughs> working. <laughs> right? Make sure there's good insulation. Yeah. Make sure the toilet's not leaking. Got a firm foundation, you know. Yeah. Glenn Bachman says, ours is to articulate the what. It's up for the school leaders to determine the how. <laughs> is, that, is that correct, Glenn? We learn from what. We learn from what. <laughs> <laughs> I can also say the same. I've learned a lot from Glenn as well. And your relentless focus on the hedgehog concept is in the center of all this. If you can build your brand, you can attract believers. How much time do you want to spend with a school leader before you hire them here to search? Is one interview enough? Is two interviews enough? Some meals? Visiting the previous school? What's enough? 
How much time do you want to invest in a board in selecting your management company or school leader? I'd encourage you to spend a lot. We don't always have the time. You've got to make it when it comes to the important critical decisions. Then this last one, demonstrate results. That's a tough one, especially early on, going through struggles. You're in high poverty areas. You get kids in that have been underserved. What does it mean to demonstrate the results for you at where you're at on your journey? As I said, what Collins would say is greatest, it's largely a matter of conscious choice and discipline. You have to believe it first, and then your actions will follow. Someone asked me this morning, how are you doing? I, I don't even remember which one it was. I first was here, the first person showed up. I said, I'm outstanding. And when I go to a restaurant, I say, how are you doing? I say, I'm outstanding today. And people look at me a little bit funny sometimes. Like, is this guy too positive? Try it. Try it sometimes. Say, I'm outstanding. Instead of saying, I'm okay, not bad. What's not bad? Okay, I'm good. I'm feeling charged today, folks. Try it. Your body will follow the picture of mine. If you're a believer, your body will follow. It'll be contagious. As Keith would say, it's infectious. One word that we're going to use over and over and over again today, our leader, this is Dr. John Carver, expert on governance. He says the purpose of governance is to ensure, usually on behalf of others, that an organization achieves what it should achieve while avoiding those behaviors and situations that should be avoided. Execute versus ensure. Boy, it's hard, especially when you're a young school. There's limited resources, limited hands. And we would distinguish between a founding board and an operating board. Because I know when I had an opportunity to lead school I led, we couldn't have done it without board members, community members, literally in, washing desks, washing tables, painting walls on Labor Day weekend before we opened on the following Tuesday. It wouldn't happen without them. So we have to be reasonable in distinguishing where you're at as an organization. But once you get into being an operating board, the word ensure will be used over and over again. What does it mean to ensure without executing? It's hard. Jim Garner, our leader, says again, to ensure. Kids are learning, number one, right? Come on, raise your hand if you can agree with me. That's number one. Kids are learning. Money and resources are well stored. Number one reason for failure and closure of charter schools in this country financial mismanagement. And the organization passed up and pursues greatness while modeling the highest legal and ethical principles. I think we all agree to that, just make an estimate, sometimes the challenging part. And we'll talk tomorrow, uh, Julie, Julie will lead a conversation on that piece, our students learning. That's not, that's not as easy as one might think to measure, right? Do we want our students to be prepared college, work, and life, what's the most important of those three? College, work, and life. What's the hardest to measure? What's the easiest to measure? Probably college readiness. Not, not, not totally easy. We, got, we have measures for college readiness. Julie will talk about tomorrow. How do you know if kids are ready for life? Character ed programs. Can we think of creative ways to systematically measure that, report out on it? Maybe, maybe not. Right. One of the things that, uh, unfortunately, you say you can learn a lot from watching people do what they shouldn't be doing. Uh, in our travels across the country and over the years, uh, we <coughs> would certainly agree with this source in identifying really some of the common pitfalls 
and challenges of governance. One is dysfunctional group dynamics, right? And there's some competing interests at times whether you got a five-member board, a seven-member board, or larger. Board leadership matters, right, Jen? It's tough because board leadership needs to bring the boards together, board members together, to correct this dysfunction. Disengaged board members, what's your attendance like at board meetings? What's the attendance of your colleagues like? Do you openly discuss that? Do you have a dashboard that says, here's our attendance, and put it out there, much like you put the performance of your school leaders out there? Are you reflective in evaluating your own performance? Joe will talk a little bit about some strategies to try to assess for yourself how effective you are as individual board members and as a cohesive group. And third, probably the biggest challenge that we see is uncertainty about roles and responsibilities. Again, execute, ensure. This slide's a good one too. Trust, trustees are often little more than high-powered, well-intentioned people engaged in low-level activities. <laughs> so we often say, don't confuse activity with accomplishment. Just because you're real busy doing a lot of stuff doesn't mean it's making a difference. Does your school leader or management company add their monthly reports at the board meeting, list off a whole laundry list of uh, things they're doing, or do they highlight the impact and outcomes of the things they're doing? Difference. Look simple, it's not so simple in practice. It's a simple way to frame the roles. Your job is to ensure, management job is to execute. So it's incumbent upon you guys to know each other, know your boards first. What the Socrates said, knowing thyself is friendly to relating well to others. It's kind of hard to relate well to others, your school leadership, management organization. You don't know yourself and your group first. So spend some time together. We always need to break some bread, have some meals. It's too important not to. What I want to do is take a five minute break uh, and then come back for about a half hour. Five to ten minute break. We'll finish up. Uh, restrooms are right around the corner. But while you do that, I have a little assignment for everyone. I want you to find out one great thing that's going on at school that's not yours. And I'm going to do some poll calling, so I'm going to pick out some people. So teacher, and try to focus on the board role. What are they doing as a board that's successful? So let's say seven minutes or so, find that out from somebody at the restaurant if you need to get a beverage. The most important the basic function of board is asking questions. Is to ask really good questions. And so one of the things we'll talk about in terms of the exemplary leaders is do you have a level five leader? If you don't, what can you do in the evaluation process and in other parts of your relationship to get them to a level five leader? What happens if you have an ineffective leader? How do you get rid of them if you need to? Let's put the brutal facts on the table. But leadership matters, obviously, to your schools, and your understanding of leadership matters. But before that, I'll ask for one volunteer, and then I'm going to pick on a couple people. What did you learn over the last 10 minutes break? Who wants to share and learn something from a group? That was personal. We talked to Charleston Heston. Charleston Heston. Uh, Joe Brown and Linda. And uh, Charleston Hessen is a, is a school that started uh, when a school closed down. And the school closed down, they had about 150 people dish, 150 kids. And uh, 
uh, once the school closed down, the community said, uh-oh, we got a problem and we need this fix. So the community came around, uh, the school, school board, and uh, said, you know, what do we need to do to make this happen? And uh, so between the community and, and the school, uh, formed this Carlton High School uh, Academy, and uh, went from a school of 150 to, I think we're somewhere around 400, maybe 400 this next coming year. So they started with no building, no money, and uh, through the relationship with their community, uh, made it happen where now we have more than double the amount of kids in their current school. So. And would you say that what, what it sounds like what you learned from them really is to mobilize your community if you can? Correct. Yeah, they, the, the emphasis that they said was, you know, get to know your neighbors, and uh, once you know your neighbors, you'll find the talent in there. And once the, the talent in your community is part of your organization, uh, only things can, can uh, turn out well. Great. Thank you. All right, now it's time to pick on someone. <clears throat> Sir, what'd you learn? Hey, Carl, uh, I learned about the, I talked to Jennifer back here in the academy, and uh, we talked a good bit about just the, the struggles that can happen with the, the difference between the, kind of the, the long term governing board and the, the founding board, and what a founding board, which is very involved, can do to, to set things in motion. Um, as I mentioned before, kind of her class has been around for 20 years, and I think we were founded with a good good vision and good focus, um, you know, a lot of a passion about you know, the, the vision and, and mission that they had. But there was a few years in there, like going 20 years, you go through some hard times, and there was some, you know, some struggles on the board, and I think coming into it now, we're coming into it at a great time where all that's going to smooth over. Where that founding board, I don't know that they'd set things up for, for smooth transitions and things like that. So we can talk a little bit about just how a founding board can do things to set things up in the future. Thank you. And I'm going to go one more on this side of the room. Uh, inspire others, 
and create a problem. I'm going to say better myself. Jim asked me, and I still don't have an official title at the Institute. He said, well, do you want your title to be innovator, leader, or do you want your title to be manager or supervisor? I don't know about you, but manager or supervisor doesn't sound too excited. Do you want a manager? Do you want a leader? Level three leaders are managers. Good leaders can manage, but can good managers lead? students are prepared for college work and life. All students 
So when you get that average number on there sometimes, the average percentile rank in third grade is 60%. 60, 60th percentile is pretty good. It's above the national norm. How many kids are at the 60th percentile? Because averages can mask a lot of things, right? So ask that question. How many individual kids met that benchmark? We need to ensure that all kids are prepared for success. Money's taken care of. The organization is run by a great leader infused with positive culture. In terms of that thing called the charter contract, we're going to talk more about it tomorrow. you got to know your charter contract. It is the legal and operational framework between LSSU and you. The expectations, the goals by which you're measured, you've got to know that charter contract. We would encourage you to roll those goals down in your expectations for your school leaders. Joe will talk a little bit more about that tomorrow in our conversation around evaluation. But know the charter contract. You can't know if the conditions are fulfilled unless you don't know. True to its mission, vision, pretty common for schools and organizations as they grow to have mission drift. Goals are clear, people and programs are wisely empowered, supported, evaluated. School leaders or management companies are evaluated at least annually. And that the organization continues to improve and stays viable. The last four. Recruits, orients, and develops its members in its own capacity. This one's a hard one, especially when you're first starting off. What skill sets do you need on your board that aren't currently there, and how are you going to get them? Do you have somebody that's strong in finances? Do you have somebody that might be strong in HR? Do you have somebody that's strong in academics? If you don't, what are you going to do to round that board skill sets out? Critically important. Then what do you do when you bring a new board member on? And how do you sharpen your own saw on a regular basis to get better? Part of that is being committed to coming to events like this. 11 is really tricky. It speaks with one voice. How does a board speak with one voice? Joe Urban. You asking me? I'm asking. Oh, well, it's like, you know, a board speaks with one voice by respecting the fact that they've got a clear chain of um, communication. So you're going to have to have a communication plan and actually have a uh, board president or school leader that's empowered to speak to the board after the board acts. Because if the board doesn't do that, you've got to you know, it doesn't matter that people have divergent viewpoints. That's obviously that's important. But when there's a crisis or when there's someone, there's something that hits, the board needs to know that you know the last action that the board has taken as a whole is the action that binds the organization. It needs to be able to put out credible information um, to help us so the public can understand how that can act. And the other way that the board speaks with one voice is through its resolutions and its votes. That's your true voice. That's how you make important decisions and come before a board vote and you speak with one voice. Understanding that varying viewpoints are healthy in that dialogue. But the decision is the decision as a collective whole. It's way too important to the stuff we're doing to win for kids every day. That's why we have a board of multiple individuals. But it's just not productive for your school leader to be out speaking in one voice and seven different members of the board to also be out speaking in different voices to the public, to different constituents and stakeholders. Tough one, but critically. Well, it's legally dangerous also. Um, because as a board member, you've got apparent authority. Even though you don't have actual authority, you can only speak through your resolutions. If you're actually out there making announcements that potentially could bind the board to third parties, you're putting yourself and your board in jeopardy. Thank you. The last one there before I move down to be ambassadors, I think that's what we all probably like about being a board member. Sometimes you get to be the ambassador. Whether it's somebody who might be interested in donating some money, community leader, you're a true ambassadors out there in communities across the state and across the country for your schools. Spread the word, your accomplishments, everything you shared earlier in the session. Get out there, find a conference to go to, get the word out about your school. And if you don't, nobody's going to. Stephen Covey, another. Uh, Another inspiring individual who uh, we relate to and use his work a lot in what we do. Uh, wisdom is the, is the beneficial use of knowledge. Wisdom is information and knowledge. 
accrediting with higher purposes and principles. There's a difference between data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. The numbers and the data, the financial and academics are just that. Unless you turn it into information, you turn that information into knowledge, and ultimately you turn the knowledge into wisdom. And that's how you reach enduring greatness. <coughs> We talked about questions. We're going to talk more about tomorrow, example questions to ask to get to these three core areas of your work. How well is your school preparing students for college, work, and life? How well is your organization leveraging its available resources and often limited resources? And how well are you doing it fulfilling your commitments, organizationally, legally, and compliance wise the whole theme of tomorrow's sessions on board self-evaluation, leadership evaluation, academic evaluation, are all centered on these three fundamental questions. And where does it all lead? It leads to the five-year cycle that's different in charter schools than in traditional district education, which is if you're not doing your job, you can lose your charter. That's the brutal facts. Keeping renewal or reauthorization often every five years, or at least on the onset of five years, that's the end in mind. You've got to keep the end in mind in terms of fulfilling your responsibilities, meeting your goals in your charter contract. And keeping that in mind is going to help ensure that you maintain that vision for excellence and integrity that you've established and you set out to do initially, especially founding goals. In Nick and team, they have to answer these questions to the broader public on behalf of their roles and authorizers. One of the things Julie will talk about tomorrow is annual reports in terms of academic performance that you'll receive to help answer that question so there's clarity between the authorizer and you, as well as the functions around finances and compliance. I want to talk about strategic planning briefly and then come back to it tomorrow. A great number of the schools uh, in this room are young and probably either don't have a strategic plan or have just begun thinking about strategic plans. Uh, but I want to do a couple of things. One is run through some best practices and then actually ask some of the older schools in the room here as we tie up before lunch just to share some great wisdom around lessons learned from strategic planning. But as a board, establishing and maintaining the mission is part and parcel with a strategic plan. And so our belief is that boards need to be heavily involved in that strategic planning process because it's big picture, it's long term, it's vision. And in strategic planning, we see that some of the core principles to consider, uh, certainly what your mission, vision, and your goals. Aligning your strategic plan with your charter contract goals, or establishing even higher goals that are in your charter contract, probably a good idea. We encourage organizations to do a SWOT analysis at the onset of their strategic planning, and it's a basic analysis of identifying what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what your opportunities are, and what your threats are. And that's a really healthy activity to do as an organization, as a board, You'll have varying perspectives on that, but that'll help guide you in a direction for strategic planning. What's your hedgehog and your competitive advantage? What's your distinctive impact? Focus on that distinctive impact and don't drift. What are the goals and objectives of your strategic plan academically, financially, community-based? And what are the difference between those short-term within the next year or so, those long-term? How are you going to reach those goals and objectives? And then the support card, which is difficult for a lot of groups. How are you going to measure that and come back to that strategic plan quarterly, <clears throat> annually, and know whether or not you're actually meeting that strategic plan? Those of you that have developed strategic plans, uh, I'd love for you to offer some wisdom. Something tells me, a former politician probably has a strategic 
process. <laughs> in the process. Tell us about what you've learned so far. Okay. Um, we're, we are working on our strategic plan, so I can't pass it out to you. But uh, our team of, uh, from the education service provider and from the board have been working on uh, clarifying the mission statement we started off with. So, uh, we have a belief statement and the potential of all students and then uh, the vision and mission. Okay. One of the most helpful things in the SWOT analysis was not only to do the strengths, needs, weaknesses as perceived by the board members and by the uh, uh, researcher, by the, you know, the, the education service provider, but we did uh, focus groups with our researchers, that's our student body, and with uh, the mentors and experts who are our faculty, with community organizations that are out there, which some of them said to us, what way it has? But that told us something about <laughs> how we're known in the community. And others had perceptions that were so off base, was so valuable, so go outside the borders. Great. Now, you know, as uh, being involved with the, you know, our, our school improvement plan as well as the strategic plan piece of that, is to make sure that you as a board, or at least one or two board members of subcommittee, if you can get it, is involved in the smaller details. And again, this is where it's tough to manage, though, where I can manage very carefully. Uh, you know, it's very tough to sit there in the meeting when you're working with the administration or with your, with your ESP to be able to let them handle it. And again, just provide that overall vision, to make sure that it's going to what you as a board, first of all, have as a vision and as a statement. But it's imperative that you get involved at that level because your ideas of where it's going, and I, by your, I mean you as the board, your ideas of where everything is going and how it needs to get there can differ greatly or cause differences in the way that the individual groups and the individual committees within a school improvement plan and team go about meeting their objectives. If they are aligning their objectives to help you with yours, then, you're, then make sure that you guys are all facing the same direction, going towards the same objective ultimately, as opposed to facing each other here and looking at one individual problem. If you can find yourself saying, you know what, that's not here, but go side by side towards that ultimate goal is where you're going, you're taking those steps concurrently, that's certainly something that's going to help you in the long run. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And I've got two minutes now. I'm going to use every minute I can. So as we move into tomorrow, what's on your mind that you'd like us to help you think through? Uh, around government for greatness so that tonight we can make sure that we plan to meet those. I open it up for a couple minutes. Anything on your mind, pressing questions, concerns, challenges that you might want to talk about uh, tomorrow? Five to ten days board failures. Fair enough. I think we can do that. What else? Self-evaluation. So the comment for those of you who couldn't hear it is there's a wide range of management structures and some full management to limited management or self-managed and what are the best strategies for a board to interface with those, within those different strategies? Probably also how do you evaluate those, you know, the performance uh, of those uh, varying structures. Yeah. What else? Well, I must say it is a pleasure to be here with you guys. Love the engagement and interaction this morning. Um, and enjoy lunch. <laughs>